Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel. Let's get on to PIBs from 17th of January till 23rd of January 2020. All right, the first press release was a launch of communication satellite GSAT 30. All right, so number one important point is this what exactly is GSAT 30? It's not a navigation satellite, rather, it's a communication satellite. Further, it has been launched not by any indigenous satellite launch vehicle, no, rather, it has been launched through a European launch vehicle and the name is Ariane 5 and the place from where it has been launched is French Guinea which is an overseas territory of the France and it is towards the northeastern side of southern American continent all right further it is it would be revolving around the earth in an elliptical format and it would be at the geosynchronous transfer orbit although towards the end it's been written that it would be at the geostationary orbit but this is not important what is important what is our key take away from this very thing is this that it is not something that would be revolving from north to south or at the pole bound movement no rather it would be either geostationary or or geosynchronous and only important point is that if any satellite that is for the communication purpose it could only be at the geostationary or the geosynchronous orbit geostationary orbit means as the name suggests stationary that is still that is the satellite would not be moving per se it would be positioned at a constant line that itself means geostationary but geosynchronous means the satellite would keep itself keep its trajectory at a sync with the orbit of the earth so that because we know earth moves on its orbit and uh, st satellite it has to keep providing the signal onto the ground so that so nothing gets disrupted and in this very manner satellite would try to be at sync with the orbit of the earth and this is why we call it as geosynchronous orbit because if we are to launch a lot of satellites then it is not possible to place all the satellites at the geostationary orbit because at max the position is like this that only three satellites can be placed here so other satellites they are to be launched at the geosynchronous transfer orbit wherein satellite would be needing to keep it at sync with the orbit of the earth and this is it although our key takeaway from this very PIB is that geostationary orbit is at the height of 36,000 km above the equator please memorize this very point because we did have one question wherein UPSC changed this very statement instead of 36,000 it wrote something else but please memorize the satellites communication satellite and that are launched at the geostationary orbit they are at the height of 36,000 km above the equator and this is our key takeaway from this very PIB further it is up over 3000 kg the satellite we're talking about here and gsat 30 would replace the insat 4a not very important further it would provide the communication service not just to the indian mainland rather it would be providing this very service to some gulf countries and asian countries and australia through c band of course ku band would be for the indian mainland and c band would be for gulf countries and asian and australian countries further because it's a communication satellite so anything that is there which is related to the communication per se it could be direct to home television service or connectivity to vsats for atm stock exchange anything for example e-governance application so all these things would be undertaken by this very satellite gsat 30 all right name itself is important from where exactly is that has it been launched and it is not being launched by the GSLV Mark III or Bahubali. No, rather we are using the European made launch vehicle because our domestic GSAT GSLV Mark III is still at the, we haven't yet gotten hold over the technology fully because we are yet to accomplish it. So, although the space mission that is to be undertaken by government of India that is the Gaganyaan. Therein we'll be using GSLV Mark III. We also call it Bahupali launch vehicle. But maybe ISRO in future would try launching these heavy satellites to GSLV Mark III. But as per this very PIB, we have used the French overseas territory and the European made launch vehicle. That's it. Why exactly we're not using GSLV, our own indigenous? This there is a history behind this because heavy launch vehicles, heavy satellites are to be launched through a GSLV launch vehicle because it's a three stage propulsion it this very launch vehicle is having where the last stage is a cryogenic stage and india is yet to master the cryogenic stage technology because we could not get the technology from any of the european nation of them from the russia because of us meddling back then but long story short we have gotten hold over the technology as of now because 
obviously we are using the same very launch vehicle to launch the Gaganyaan space mission but in the future maybe ISRO will try using the same very satellite to launch the heavy communication satellite as well. So all this was deviation because there has to be a fair bit of idea exactly why this exam is not just about the factual details we should be having analytical understanding also so all this was entirely deviation key takeaway from this very BIB is just one how much far is the geostationary orbit and yeah that's it gsat means what a navigation satellite or a communication satellite so basically it's a communication satellite and launched to add the elliptical geosynchronous transfer orbit further in the 2011 we were having one question on to this very thing only we are in the question reads satellites used for telecommunication relay are kept in geostationary orbit all right a satellite is said to be in such an orbit when number one orbit is geosynchronous number two orbit is circular number three orbit lies in the plane of the earth's equator and number four is the orbit is at an altitude of or at a height of 22,236 km. So clearly right here we have seen that geostationary orbit is at the height of 36,000 km above the equator. So if we just know the one statement we'll be able to find the correct answer because number four is definitely wrong and we are left with only option A here that is one, two and three. So all these th three statements are correct either way we have read that orbit could be geosynchronous and it could be elliptical elliptical means basically a circular kind of so this is what the statement is about it could be geosynchronous it could be circular orbit lies in the plane of the earth's equator that that indeed is correct because we know this is correct i, do, I don't have a diagram here or a pen here to draw it but this is correct it lies at the plane of the earth's equator and it is an altitude of 36,000 kilometers so this is this is quite simple question if you just have a hold over basic things right further this is with regard to one point this was there in a long speech of one of the minister but only one key takeaway is from that very speech and this is this fdi in multi-brand retail is allowed only up to 49 percent so we are not having some 75 or 100 percent fdi in multi-brand retail it's only up to the tune of 49 percent please memorize this very point and this can be used in our answer writing as well because this is a tricky point multi-brand retail is our keyword here it's not wholesale trade it's a multi-brand retail trade it's like in one retail shop we are having brand of we, ha we are having goods of many brands being sold so in that very manner only 49 percent fti is allowed Further, this very PIB was about 51st K9 Vajra T gun. So what exactly is this? We are writing gun here, but we could be we could be asked 51st K9 Vajra is what? So basically, it's a gun. Raksha Mantri Shri Rajnath Singh flags off 51st K9 Vajra T gun from LND Armored System Complex in Gujarat. Who flagged it off and from where exactly has been manufactured is not important. Only the name is important. 51st K9 Vajra T is what? It's a gun. That's it. Further, this is very important. It is by Ministry of Women and Child Development. So basically, it is stating that to mark 25 years of adoption of Beijing Platform for Action, Ministry of Women and Child Development, the National Commission for Women and United Nations Women organized a national consultation on the review of Beijing Plus 25. So review has been done. So what exactly is the Beijing? Beijing, it, it's its entire name, Beijing Platform for Action. All right. So what exactly happened was back then in the year 1995, there was fourth world conference on women held where in Beijing. And the topic was women. So definitely it was to talk about the gender equality and empowerment of women. It was one of the largest ever gathering of the United Nations where a declaration was adopted and we just call it Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action just to bring in gender equality to go for women empowerment and that's it. Because 2020 marks completion of 25 years of this declaration being adopted so we just call it Beijing Plus. 25 and this is it all right further in the 2015 we did had one question wherein we were asked this very thing 
Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action often seen in news is what? Number one, it's a strategy to tackle the regional terrorism. Number two, it is with regard to sustainable economic growth. And number three, it was about women empowerment. And number four, it was about the trafficking, wildlife tra trafficking. So clearly, even if we had the slightest of hint that it is definitely for women empowerment, that we would have gotten the right answer. Question is very, very simple. All the options are very, very contrary victory terrorism sustainable economic growth women empowerment or wildlife tracking nothing confusing here it's indeed women empowerment so that's it so we got our answer it is the an agenda for women's empowerment and outcome of a world conference convened by the united nations so i really don't think upsc gonna be asking us this question again and that too in this very simple manner but maybe it could be twisted a bit and this is how we can expect a question on this very topic or we can use this thing in our mains answer writing all right further this is important 14th foundation day of dedicated freight corridor corporation of india celebrated we can use these points and mains answer writing so up till now 500 dedicated freight corridor has been developed so there are 500 kilometer of railway tract wherein railways carrying freight only are being run definitely government is trying to make it up till 991 kilometer by 2020 but up till now it's just 500 kilometer further minister is stating that this definitely serves two purpose number one we go for maximum utilization of the path and number second point is that this leads to increase in the average speed of freight trains because if we are to run the consumer trains or the passenger trains or the freight trains on the same very railway track then there's gonna be a lot of stoppage by the freight trains but if you are having the dedicated freight corridors for the freight trains then it would really be not be needing to stop at any of the station unless it reaches its destination so in this very manner the average speed of the freight train would definitely increase significantly this is what minister is trying to convey further this point is important that IRCTC pays compensation for delays in the Tejas trains. Tejas trains, we are now we know they are super fast trains which has been launched by the government of India. But if these trains get delayed, then people are compensated by the IRCTC. And minister is saying that in the same very manner, even railway is to compensate its consumer if the freight trains gets delayed if there is a late arrival of goods so this is something that we can write as a suggestion if question pertains to the railway sector per se or the logistics sector per se because we know that india's ranking in the world bank's logistics performance index is just 44 so a lot needs to be done so this is something that we can use as a point in our answer as a suggestion in our answer further this is with regard to this thing that the Government of India has launched a center of excellence in blockchain technology in Bengaluru. Nothing pre-specific here is just that if you are to talk about the blockchain technology because it's still in the development stage so we can write always in the answer that government of India is also very active in this very regard and it has even opened a center of excellence in the Bengaluru for this very manner. So this is something we can write in the answer that's it. Further this is very important for our Pillins exam and that is about the class language vice president stresses the need to preserve and promote the classical language so basically up till now there are six languages that enjoy the classical language status in india and what are these languages number one tamil nadu i'm so sorry tamil tamil language is the first language that got the classical status tag way back in the 2004 because as far as I remember, we did have one question wherein we were asked which of these languages got the classical language tag first. So Tamil Nadu is the answer. Then followed by the Sanskrit in 2005, then Kannad, then Telugu, then Malayalam and then Odia. Recently, that is 2014, Odia got the classical language tag. Alright, further, what is the criteria in order to declare a language as a classical language? All these are the criteria. We have exactly four criteria and please memorize all these four criteria. Number one, high antiquity of its early text or recorded history over a period of 1000 to 2000 years this is very very important language has to be quite old and it should be having a recorded history and that too of precisely either 15 to 2000 years 
further a body of ancient literature or text which is considered a valuable heritage by the generation of speakers so definitely people have to consider that language as valuable otherwise why would they be into they be interested into preserving it in order to give it a classical status right further the literary tradition be original and not borrowed from another speech community so this is very very important because there are many language languages that are vying for this very tag but point 3 becomes a bone of contention because it turns out that those languages have borrowed a lot of features from the another languages and this is where the debate sets on so number 3 is important that the literary tradition it has to be original and not borrowed from any other speech of the community further number 4 point is this the classical language and literature being distinct from modern there may also be discontinuity between the classical language and its later forms or its offshoot it's very very important because sometimes we have seen in some of the test series that this fourth statement gets twisted at the face value we would be like maybe we have to have some sort of continuity the language should be as per its original form but no this is not correct because we're talking about language that could be either that could be as old as some 1500 2000 years so maybe there could be some sort of discontinuity from the the way it is being spoken right now and the way it was way back in the 2000 some 2000 years right so some sort of discontinuity can be there it could be slightly different from what it used to be so this is something that is there we really can be so rigid when it comes to classifying these languages that's it please memorize all these points all four points are important further what exactly is the benefit of getting a classical language why is everybody vying for this very thing so these are the benefits number 1 two major annual international awards for scholars of eminence in classical indian languages all right further center of excellence for studies in classical language is set up all right further university grants commission is requested to create or to start with at least in the central universities a certain number of professional chairs for the classical languages so declared so the language would be getting some sort of help some sort of support from the government of india in terms of identifying the people who have done good in this very language and further providing a chair at least in the central university for further research further this was the 2014 prelims question which reads consider the following statement number 1 gujarati kannad telugu which of the above have been declared as a classical language by the government of india very very simple except gujarati we two these two have been declared as a classical language so answer becomes c 2 and 3 so kannada telugu is our classical language but gujarati is not further this is about the text prokil what exactly is text prokil this is the first export promotion council text means textile pro means promotion cil means council so when was it established it was established in the year 1954 please memorize this point this is the first export promotion council to promote what to promote the cotton textile so anything that is to be done in order to promote the cotton textile this export promotion council would be doing that so this is our broad theme further the council is a one stop point for those who wish to source textiles from india so any exporter any foreign nationalist if he wants to import any cotton textile from india then definitely when we are not ruling ruled by the british right now we are a sovereign state so maybe in olden times we used to have this lot of connections between the british exporters and the local weavers but uh, maybe we are deviating now let's just take the point in hand so basically here any importer from the foreign nation so that is an importer from our perspective so it would just be needing to contact contact the tax procel all sorts of he- help would be all sort of help would be given by this very council in order to enable that very person to import the cotton textile for india that's it further it would also assist the ministry of textiles in formulating policies to promote textile exports i mean this is either way obvious this is a council that is there to facilitate the export of the cotton textile so anything that is done that is to be done in order to undertake this very activity would be done by the tax procel that's it year of establishment is important because it's a factual information it's 1954 all right further 
this is important an agreement to end the baru riang refugee crisis so what exactly is this crisis so we just have to look at the background and that too briefly so what happened was in the year 1997 there was some ethnic tensions between which and which community so baru riang tribals and the mijo so i mean we are not very very well versed with the north eastern states per se so i i have seen people sometime confusing as if the people fled from the tripura to mizoram but please memorize this thing that this is not the case people fled from mizoram to tripura they sought shelter in the tripura so the migration was from mizoram to tripura and this is important so right now they are residing they are refugee in the tripura bru riang tribal we talking about here and when did this happen it happened here 1997 so bru riang tribal they were forced to flee mizoram and seek shelter in tripura basically this was because of ethnic tension so right now we just need to focus on this very agreement because this has led to final solution to this entire problem so what government of india has done is that around 34000 bru refugees will be settled in tripura and would be given aid from the center to help them with their rehabilitation so please memorize this thing point this is not something we are in the refugees would be sent back to the mizoram to their homeland no rather the settlement is to be undertaken in the tripura itself the state we are right now they are residing because this was the bone of contention earlier agreement they were trying to send them back to the mizoram but bru refugees were of the view that there was no guarantee that the, the same thing would not happen again and government could really not sort of give them this sort of insurance assurance that that would not happen again so that was the bone of contention because of which all other settlements failed so only good thing about this new agreement i mean there are a lot of good things but the innovative thing is that the settlement would be undertaken in the tripura itself and the people would not be sent back to the mizoram so bru refugees would be settled in the tripura and would be given aid what sort of aid would they be given this is it these are the aids that the families would be given a 40 by 30 square feet residential plots and they would be given aid that is fixed a deposit of rupees 4 lakh plus for two for two years they would be provided 5000 cash per month and also free ration for two years and further 1.5 lakh aid would be given to build their houses and government of tripura would be providing the land under this very agreement because we know land is a state subject further these people would get all the rights that normal residents of the states get because we are going for their resettlement in the tripura itself up till now they used to reside in tripura but they were not having any sort of the facilities that the usual resident or normal resident of the state gets because they were refugees but as per this very agreement now they would be given all sort of help and they would be given the status of the normal residents of the state and they would now be able to enjoy the benefits of social welfare scheme to the central as well as state government that's it further so we're done with this now moving on to the this very pib pragati what is pragati pragati means proactive governance and timely implementation so if question pertains to good governance then we can quote this thing that government of india has launched pragati platform that stands for proactive governance and timely implementation so basically this is what this is an ict that is information communication and technology based multi model platform so it was launched in 2015 year of launch is important 2015 what would it do so here in prime minister of india would be interacting with the all the office bearers who are responsible for executing the government's project and would be taking response from them on to the implementation status of the all the schemes of the government so basically pragati is an integrating and interactive platform aimed at addressing the common man's grievances pragati also helps in simultaneously monitoring and reviewing the important programs and projects of the government of india as well as projects flagged by various states government all right so when was it launched in the 2015 this point is important and it is chaired by the prime minister of india further this is next pib we are in central government has notified national startup advisory council 
so what exactly is the national startup advisory council so as a name suggests it's a council that would be advising the government of india on all the measures that are needed to be taken to build a strong ecosystem of entrepreneurship in india a strong ecosystem to go for the startup initiatives in india further who would be the chairman this is important so it would be chaired by the ministry for commerce and industry very very important not by ministry of minister of the entrepreneurship because we have a separate ministry for the entrepreneurship but this national startup advisory council would not be chaired by that very ministry rather it would be chaired by ministry for commerce and industry please keep this thing in your mind further there are certain non official members also that would be noted by the central government so non official members would not be noted not nominated by the president rather it would be nominated nominated by the central government from various categories like any anybody who is doing good in the startup sector in the entrepreneurship sector so that would be nominated by the central government as a non official member for the the nominees of the concerned ministries departments organizations not below the rank of joint secretary secretary will be ex officio member of the council further joint secretary department promotion of industry and internal trade will be the convener of the council that's it all the things are there to be memorized only nothing to be understood per se please memorize all these points further this is important basically here we are talking about the paris convention so what exactly has happened is that there has been lot of cases where in khadi logo has been misused by the private entrepreneurs so khadi is fighting back to prevent the misuse of its trademark internationally and it it is seeking protection under the international trademark protection of symbol of the charkha under the article 6 tier of the paris convention so this is important so what exactly is this article 6 of the paris convention so basically this article 6 of paris convention it protects the industrial property of 1883 so its name article 6 of the paris convention for the protection of industrial property of 1883 1967 stockholm act protect armorial bearings flags and other state emblems as well as official signs and hallmarks of the state's party to the paris convention the signs published with the world intellectual property organization wipo under this act are prevented from being registered or used as trademarks across the world without authorization so entire things are important article 6 of the paris convention for the protection of industrial property of 1883 1967 stockholm act so protection is granted to the armorial bearing flags or any state emblem or any other official sign or hallmark of the parties are there that are party to the state paris convention and also the signs published with the wipo under this act they cannot be used by any other agency without the authorization so khadi is seeking protection under this very thing further this is with regard to an32 aircraft of the indian air force so basically this aircraft has used the 10% blend of indian biojet fuel this is very very important because both engines of the aircrafts were powered by the biojet indigenous fuel so basically fuel was developed way back in 2013 but because we were not having any aircraft per se in which this biofuel is to be tested because the engine of the aircraft is to be compatible with that very modified fuel basically biofuel we are talking about here so right now the air force has used the aircraft an32 where in the 10% blended indian budget fuel was powered and it ran off successfully and this is good further this is important that biojet fuel is produced from non edible tree born oils grown and produced from the tribal areas of chatigarh state so what exactly is the biojet fuel we just have to understand that this is obtained from the non food items so it could be up from the edible food edible items also but just so as to not to jeopardize the food security we are trying to produce it from the non edible tree born oil so basically what is biofuel is important and we have already studied what the biofuel is in one of the pib so that's it
that further this is with regard to this very thing that election commission of india today organized the first sukumar sen memorial lecture so sukumar sen he was the first chief election commissioner of the independent india so this is important who was the first chief election commissioner of independent india sukumar sen so he served as the chief election commissioner from march 1950 till 1958 very very important further this is important and this is with regard to subhash chandra bose aapda prabandhan puraskar aapda means disaster prabandhan means management and puraskar means awards so these awards are to be given in order to successfully manage the disasters further three awards are there and both institutions as well as individuals are eligible for these awards so it's not like only institutions can get the awards no even individuals too can get this very award further if an application by an institution does not i mean if okay an application by an institution does not debar any individual from that institution to apply for the award in this individual capacity so it's like if one is a party to the award as a part of any organization that does not mean that that very person cannot be given this award on an individual basis no person a can get this award just being because just being a part of the institution as well as just being as an individual as well so this is what it means further eligibility is important only indian nationals and indian institution this is important because intuitively we would be thinking as if anybody could get the award why would the foreigners would be excluded but then this is how it is only indian nationals and the indian institutions can apply for the award any international or institute can nominate a candidate for the consideration of this prize and also candidate can self nominate themselves so a person a thinks that the individual a or organization x or z is doing well that person a can nominate them but also person a can nominate himself or herself as well so self nomination is also there further who has been chosen to be given this award for 2020 so this is to be given to the disaster mitigation and management center uttarakhand in the institution category and in individual category this is to be given to the shri kumar munnan singh that's it so this this is it and we are done with the pibs from 17th of january till 23rd of january so also if this is just one request if you think that these videos are helping you in any way then kindly share them further so that maximum people can get the benefit so this is it we are done with the pibs thank you so much for watching and goodbye